Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank Monique and also the organizing committee. I just want to say how much I enjoyed Simone's wonderful keynote. And uh, it's really a privilege to, to be able to present the work that I'm doing. And hopefully, it'll be useful. Clearly, um, I'm, not, I'm not from the field of education, but I am an educator. And I have many, many years as an educator in the university context, but also in the context of public history, and particularly in museums, as sites of informal, of informal learning. In 1993, when the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum opened, Leon Wieseltier declared, the museum is a pedagogical masterpiece. Now that's 20 years ago, uh, more than 20 years ago, and the museum that I worked on and continue to work on in Poland is, it comes, it opened in 2013, the core exhibition opened in 2014, so there's a 20-year gap. Now Leon Wieseltier is a public intellectual, a journalist uh, associated with the New Republic, and not a museum professional, and clearly came to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum with a lot of preparation, very well primed, very well prepared. And in essence, he, as a visitor, extrapolated a pedagogy that had been, from his point of view, materialized in the architecture and in the exhibition of the Holocaust Museum. Now, I should say that museums are more than their permanent exhibition that the Warsaw, uh, the Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews, is an educational and cultural center. It is an institution of public history. But my responsibility was specifically for the core exhibition. And what I can offer is a kind of pedagogical reading of the work that we did, because it could have implications for what kind of learning outcomes you might anticipate and how one might study that. So that's really my, my objective. Now, I was really curious in reading his assessment, and I wanted to know what precisely, from his point of view, made this museum a pedagogical masterpiece. And I've identified what I would call seven pedagogical principles. The first one, the building itself teaches. Now, this is very much what you'd call architecture parlant, that is, architecture that talks, quite literally. And Michael Sorkin, an architectural critic, has done his own reading. And this kind of architecture is always, uh, if you will, balanced between being uh, an incredible architectural statement and being kitsch. And it's not, not being kitsch in its, uh, if you will, distillation of uh, references to Holocaust architecture that is really its success. Also, the building is very sensitive to light, and it's a it's a it's a marvelous building. But for uh, for Wieseltier and also for others, the building itself is a kind of experience that works poetically, subliminally, intuitively, but with enough, if you will, concreteness to have some literal references without being uh, too literal. And I would say that's probably at the heart of the idea that the building itself teaches. And I would argue that many of the historical sites, the sites of genocide, they are cases where the physical infrastructure in and of itself, the architecture and the experience of space, the experience of space shouldn't be underestimated because the tendency is to think of museums and exhibitions as essentially visual experiences. And actually, I would argue that they are as much, if not more so, what we would call haptic experiences. That is to say, they are very much about the orientation of the body in space. And that's not to be underestimated because if you go to a film or you go to theater, what you're watching moves and you are stationary, as in this room. But if you come to a museum, what's there generally is stationary and you move. And so the story unfolds, in the case of narrative museums, the plot unfolds as the visitor moves. And that the, if you will, attention and the uh, apprehension and the experience has very, very much to do with movement, with the orientation of the body in space. And that's what architecture is all about. Pedagogical principle number two. And that is that the memorial, just a second, let me see if I can do this. The memorial saves the museum from its fate as a museum. And the museum saves the memorial from its fate as a memorial by leading the visitor from history to silence, which is the Hall of Remembrance, a temple of ineffability, 
memory stiffened by history, then struck dumb. And so for, for Wieseltier, the incorporation of a silent memorial space at the end of the visitor's path is for him a pedagogical principle. The idea that the story doesn't end on a redemptive note, that there is no, there is no triumphal moment, that uh, there is no silver lining, and that the, uh, the, the, if you will, the visitor is given a space of absolute silence. And of course, this space is used in a whole variety of ways for commemorative service, services and the like. But for the individual visitor, and even for groups, it is a moment of silence. It is what my colleagues in Poland, Barbara Engelking and Jacek Leochak, who worked with us on the Holocaust Gallery, would call a kind of metaphysical break. And so that, would, that for him, now, I, I, one of the things I want to argue is that we actually treat the issue of memorial, memorialization, and history exhibition quite differently in the in Pauline Museum, but this is his pedagogical principle number two. Pedagogical principle number three, juxtaposing the pain of survivors with the painstaking research of the historians, the subjectivity of the victims and the objectivity of historical evidence. Feeling must be annotated by fact. And so this would be his pedagogical principle number three. And I'm showing here a, a wonderful photograph by Frederick Brenner from his diaspora project. Of, these are Greek uh, survivors of Auschwitz. And this photograph is actually installed in the exhibition, which actually has some very interesting contemporary artists, um, in a sense, offering a kind of emotional anchor to the more objective historical and more factual presentation. Principle number four. A large part of the instruction that this museum imparts is tactile. Now, I don't know whether he was supposed to, but he does describe, you know, moving his hand across the wood of the Auschwitz barrack. Well, that's another story. Uh, um, uh, he cites objects. The museum is a kind of reliquary. The relics are sacred and profane. And that's a very, very interesting way of characterizing the role of objects in this museum. From what I recall when the museum opened in 93, there were actually relatively few objects, and this is very much the approach of Sheikha Weinberg, who's also the, the really visionary that created Beret Futsot, the Museum of the Diaspora today, the Museum of the Jewish People. And so the, but objects I think were added, and there are now about 900 objects, original objects in this, in this exhibition. But for Wieseltier, they were very important, and they functioned as relics in a reliquary, which suggests a kind of a, a religious uh, quality about them. So not so much as historical material evidence in a forensic sense, but rather as touchstones that are very emotional and even, um, uh, I would say, spiritual. And, and even when they are profane, profane objects. The railway car, the Auschwitz barracks. And then what you, you see is a chain of associations. And for him, this is what's pedagogical. What's pedagogical here is the chain of associations and the act of historical imagination that is triggered in, for him by these objects. And what he says is, you try to imagine their materiality awakens you. It reminds you that all this dying was lived. But lived by whom? And one of the most memorable and one of the most beautiful and I think one of the most successful installations within this rather diverse, really kind of multi-form um, exhibition is this Tower of Faces. Uh, and it's based on one collection, a, a collection of photographs from one town. Now, um, I was fascinated by his reading of the Tower of Faces because what he reads here functions in a completely different way in, uh, in the in Pauline Museum, which I'll get to in a moment. So this is pedagogical principle number five about the tower of photographs. Uh, and I would say tower of faces is more appropriate. Now, now you see who died. They do not look like they're going to die, though they are going to die. Around those thousands of people in these hundreds of photographs, there is not a trace of the angel of death. Only the contemporary viewer sees it hovering impatiently in every frame. And actually, it's exactly what we try to work against in, in the thousand-year history that we present in Warsaw. But nonetheless, I think here, this is how this functions. That is to say that, literally, life before the Holocaust is embedded within 
the Holocaust narrative. And that, that, that's a very, very specific way to locate uh, life before the Holocaust, which the form formulation itself already says a lot. Pedagogical principle number six, and that is this pedagogical masterpiece, this exhibition, resists the rhetoric about Shoah v'Gvura, the Holocaust, Holocaust and heroism, as if there was as much heroism as there was Holocaust. So clearly he, he's here really referring rather to uh, what has been conventionally an Israeli perspective, and it has very much to do with the days of commemoration, commemorating the Holocaust, commemorating the, the Day of Independence. Pedagogical principle number seven. Um, Jews who wander, or a Jew who wanders through these galleries, who feels pity for his people, oh, pardon me, who feels his, I'm sorry, um, who fe oh, yes, okay, a Jew who wanders through these galleries, who feels pity for his people, and tur uh, turns pity, turn feels how pity for his people turns into pity for his race. Anyone who looks at these images of corpses and sees only images of Jews has a grave moral problem. So that goes obviously to the wider, to the wider perspective. And what's fascinating for me is that this is the opening of the Holocaust exhibit, and it starts with, and this is of course embedding this um, museum and this narrative within an American national narrative because it starts with American troops liberating concentration camps. That's the beginning, the beginning of the exhibition, not the end. Now here from those who made the exhibition, from Shaika Weinberg, Yesha Yahu Weinberg, and from um, Rina Elieli. And, and this I think is really, is really critical. Um, visitors find themselves in this exhibition positioned between two poles, between the concrete and the abstract, the historical and the metaphoric, the unique and the universal. The educational process is taking place between one pole and the other. There should never be an attempt at resolving the tension between the poles. And so this, this then leads me to an assessment of why this is a pedagogical masterpiece from the perspective of Elizabeth Ellsworth 10 years later. And this is from Ellsworth. And she starts also from Wieseltier and she takes it, I think, a step further. And I have no idea if Liam were to go back to the Holocaust Museum now, 20 years later, what he would say, because it's evolved over that 20 years, although that exhibition is still up and running. And what she writes is, the power of the address of this museum's pedagogy lies in its indeterminacy. In its indeterminacy. And, and the idea that you could take um, if you will, um, an event in which the stakes are so high and to locate the power of its pedagogy in the indeterminacy, in the space between those poles and other poles, that's a very provocative, uh, I would say, approach to, let's call it Holocaust education. In this case, it's pedagogy. And so what she says is that the task of such a museum and such an exhibition it's about learning a relationship to Holocaust history and memory. And now we've landed at Chopin Airport and we are in the baggage area. And there is a large advertisement for, uh, well, it says, an incredible journey, a thousand years and a day, Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews. Um, and taxi drivers have variously referred to it as a Holocaust museum, a Jewish museum, and now it's called, either if people have the patience, it's called Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews, or Pauline Museum, or even just Pauline, which I'll explain in a moment. A few days after we opened, had our grand opening and opened the core exhibition on October, in October uh, 2014, Arnold Eisen, the Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, who had attended, wrote the following. It's not often that a museum makes history as well as chronicles it, and rare too when otherwise cautious observers remark at the opening of a new museum that it may prove a source of hope and pride that propels an entire society forward. 
Both of those things happened this week in Warsaw with the opening of Polin Museum. And the cautious observer is really an understatement uh, for a variety of reasons. And what I would say is that buried inside that very polite and very elegant statement is in fact the conflicting narrative between, I would say, largely a Jewish perspective on the Holocaust and, um, well, to put it very, very simply, a Polish perspective. And so the cautiousness had very much to do with whether or not this museum would somehow uh, tell the, the, this thousand year story in a way that did not sidestep or, uh, if you will, um, diminish the seriousness of the, this terrible catastrophe and much else. This is where we have created Polin Museum of the History of Polish Jews. We've created it literally on the rubble um, of the ghetto, of the, of the Warsaw ghetto, which was home to the, the Europe's largest Jewish community in the neighborhood of Moranov. So it was also the site of the pre-war Jewish neighborhood. About a third of the city of Warsaw before the war was, was uh, Jewish. And uh, the, this site is a very resonant site. After the Germans suppressed the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, they leveled the, the ghetto, with, and which means the pre-war Jewish neighborhood, they leveled it to rubble. And a year later, after the Warsaw Uprising, they destroyed 80, more than 80% of the city of Warsaw. So this is literally where, where we've created the museum, which means that we are a site-specific museum and we're sitting on a site of genocide. And that's the first major difference if you will, between the Holocaust Museum in uh, Washington, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in Lower Manhattan in New York, we are uh, a site-specific museum. In 1948, on the fifth anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, on the rubble of the ghetto, there was the unveiling of the Monument to the Ghetto Heroes, and you can see it here, and you can see the destroyed city of Warsaw in the background. And consistent with the kind of memorials that were created at the time, the side of the memorial where the commemorations take place was devoted to the heroes of the ghetto, which is to say the ghetto fighters. And on the reverse side, it was a commemoration of the deportation of 300,000 Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka a year earlier, not quite a year earlier. Now, what I would argue is that this museum completes the memorial complex by not being a Holocaust museum. And that that is the opportunity, that is the challenge, and that, if you will, is where I would start to be thinking about the, uh, if you will, the, the value of this approach for Holocaust education. In 1993, the idea for this museum arose, and it was actually uh, sparked by the opening of the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And a member of a Jewish NGO that had been established in Poland right after the war, the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland, went to the opening of the Holocaust Museum in Washington. She was very impressed, and she said to herself, if there's a Holocaust Museum in Washington, there should be a Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Poland. And so very early uh, during the 90s, and this is four years after the fall of communism, which is amazing, very, very early, the city of Warsaw allocated that orange area, which stands facing the monument of the ghetto heroes, and this is now uh, years after the creating of this communist era housing. You can imagine what the housing crisis was like with 80% of the city destroyed. And, you know, and they allocated that area in the event of a miracle that such a museum that seemed to be so unpromising would actually ever happen. It would take a miracle because it was a very ambitious project and it was shortly after the fall of communism. And so through a public-private partnership that was unique in Poland, the idea from 1993 developed as a project from 1996 and this is a museum that was created from the inside out. First the exhibition, then the museum was founded, then the architectural competition was held. And so that was 2005, and that was a public-private partnership, a project initiated by the association in Poland, the Jewish NGO, and with partners from the city of Warsaw, the Minister of Culture, and the division of labor was that the public partners would oversee the construction of the building and pay for it, and that the private partner would tell the story and raise the money for it. And that's what we did. 
We opened the building in 2013, the core exhibition in 2014, and in the first year and a half, two years, we've had about a million visitors. And so today, the museum sits in a relationship to the monument. That is the key, the key. And if one wanted to really capture the contested, the idea of contested history, it is, I would say, I would actually start with monuments. Because the, the hot issue at the moment is to create a monument to the Polish righteous on the other side of the building so that you'd have a clear view from the largest glass window in all of Poland to a monument to the righteous. And, to, and that's been a huge source of controversy, and it hits to the actual, I would say it hits to the essence of uh, these conflicted histories. Um, uh, it, it was interesting for me to read recently, to read a 1993 conversation between Adam Michnik and Habermas, in which um, Adam Michnik talks about the triumphalism of innocence as a kind of criticism of a certain kind of historic, Polish historical policy. And then I, I was thinking to myself, the new right-wing government that just come in, has just come in talks about a pedagogy of shame. So on the one hand, the right criticizes the left for a pedagogy of shame, and the left criticizes the right for the triumphalism of innocence. And that is absolutely instantiated in the current argument debate about the monuments and the placement of them in relationship to this museum. So that's, that story is still unfolding, but um, I'll keep you posted. The architectural competition required that the building stand in an appropriate relationship to the monument. And so it is a glass building that echoes the geometry of the monument, but it is minimalist on the outside and all the drama is on the inside and it is a glass building on a site of genocide which is very unusual and I take it as a gesture of hope in the face of tragedy without moving towards what I would call a redemptive narrative. And on the glass is stenciled the word Pauline and that word Pauline comes from, if you will, the inspiration for using the term Pauline which is the Hebrew word for Poland, and Poland, spelled the same way as the Yiddish word for Poland. It comes from a legend, and I'll show you in a moment uh, how that legend works and why the museum took its name from, from, the wor from that word and from that legend, and then silk screened that word in Latin letters and Polish, uh, pardon me, and Hebrew letters um, on the glass of the building. So all the drama's on the inside. And the message of this architecture is the exact opposite uh, the, the building in Germany, the Liebeskind building, the opposite of the uh, building for the Holocaust Museum and the opposite for Yad Vashem, the exact opposite. This is a building um, where the, in the interior is warm and organic and where the building itself is extremely sensitive to light. So it's all about light, transparency, openness. Um, and it is, um, which is itself a message about what this museum, uh, what this museum is, and what it strives for. And so we enter the the core exhibition. And um, for me, there there are a number of, of really critical issues in thinking about this museum and in thinking about Holocaust museums and their relationship to history. And I say history in the general sense. Whose history? What history? History of World War II? History of a particular country? Jewish history? What hi history of genocide? What history? So my first question, are all museums of Jewish history in Europe Holocaust museums by another name? And this is, a, this is really, uh, this is not a trivial question. And I'll say a little bit more about it in a moment. And are all Holocaust history museums memorials by another name? And what is the pedagogical value of setting the Holocaust within a thousand year history of Polish Jews? Because that's what we've done. And for us, it is absolutely our central mission. So a quick word about the plan of the core exhibition. It's a 1,000 year story. It begins in a poetic forest where we tell the legend of Pauline and it moves through seven historical periods. The largest single gallery is the Holocaust gallery. It's here, it's a double height gallery. So you essentially come down and go around in a circle and come out into a circulation space and the story doesn't begin with the Holocaust and it doesn't end with the Holocaust. It comes forward all the way to the present. And I would say that the least 
attended to and the least understood period is the post-war period. From a Jewish perspective outside of Poland, there is no post-war period. Everything ended with the Holocaust. So the uh, importance of the post-war period in this narrative uh, cannot be underestimated. It's also the most sensitive, the most difficult. And what kind of an exhibition? On the one hand, one of our greatest assets is that we're at, on the actual site. But the actual site was rubble. There's no historic building, with no barracks, no railway car, none of the kind of, uh, if you will, reference points, material touchstones that Wieseltier uh, valued so much. And also, as a museum uh, of a thousand year history, we had, we started with, without a collection, we have relatively few objects, we show probably about 200 objects in the exhibition. If we had more, we might show more, but we didn't start from a collection. But what we did create is what I would call a theater of history, which comes from a history not so much of collection-based museums, but from a history of exhibition. Now that said, objects do play an important role, but we are not limited to objects. We do not start from a collection. We start from the story. And we've created a new kind of object. Now in terms of experiential learning and informal education, I want to share with you what I think of as the gold standard, and then I want to argue for it as a key component, potentially a key component, in what we might think of as, quote, Holocaust education. It's a stretch, but uh, we'll, see, we'll see whether or not you find it resonant. This is the, this is, uh, I would say, probably the most spectacular element in the core exhibition and also in the museum. And what it is is a new kind of object, a new kind of object. There were once hundreds of wooden synagogues across the length and breadth of, of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which today includes Belarus, Lithuania, and Ukraine. And uh, during the Second World War, whatever uh, of these great 17th and 18th century wooden synagogues were left, they were destroyed. And so in terms of the way we normally think of an original object, we normally think that it's only an original object if it's made from the original material. But we had a completely different approach. In the absence of any of these original synagogues, we worked with an educational nonprofit in Massachusetts whose mission is the recovery of lost objects. And what they say is, you can never recover the original object in the sense of the original material, but you can recover the knowledge of how to make it by making it using traditional materials, tools, and techniques. And that's what we did with a team of 300 students, volunteers, and experts, timber framers, experts in the conservation of the interior of historical churches. And we worked from documentation. It turns out that the synagogue that once stood in Gvozdjets, today in Ukraine, is the single best documented of any of the wooden synagogues. And so we had photographs, we had architectural drawings, and then we proceeded to build it. We did the timber framing in six weeks at an open-air museum in the south of Poland. We worked with these teams of students, some of whom had never picked up a paintbrush, in uh, existing masonry synagogues in cities across the length and breadth of Poland. And we completed these, uh, each of the panels in two-week workshops. We took that timber frame structure apart, we pulled the pegs out, and we brought it to Warsaw, and we reassembled it, and we hoisted it, and we um, suspended this 25-ton structure from cables. And so this object is very, very linked, I would argue, to the view that there are two modes of Holocaust memory. There are probably more, but there are two critical modes of Holocaust memory. One mode, which is the dominant mode in Holocaust education, is to remember the genocide. But the second mode, which is very powerful, and it's the mode that we represent, and that is to remember not only those who died and how they died, but also the world that they created and that was lost with them. And those who come to the museum with a Holocaust entrance narrative come away with a deeper sense of loss. For them, this is an expression of what was lost. And in the documentation that we provide for this project, one of the photographs that we have is a photograph from the beginning of the war with Germans in the town, I think it's Zabudov, standing on the bima talking with 
uh, heads of the Jewish community, and it, this would have been in the Soviet-occupied part of Poland, and then coming back a year later and burning down the synagogue. And so the, the story and the fate of these synagogues is in fact part of a Holocaust narrative, although within the exhibition itself, it doesn't function that way. But the idea that the museum completes the memorial complex, not by being a memorial, and not by focusing on the Holocaust, but by doing the following, that we go to the, we go to the monument to honor those who died by remembering how they died. And we come to the museum to honor them and those who came before and those who came after by remembering how they lived. And it is a moral obligation, a moral responsibility to remember how they lived and how they lived for a thousand years. In the great Jewish tradition of Shiva, of the seven days of mourning, when you come to console the mourner, you do not console the mourner by remembering how the person died. You, you remember how they lived. And this is also a task uh, that I think is a, a critical task in, in terms of our thinking about so-called Holocaust education. And in the workshop that I attended this afternoon, it was fascinating that in Poland, educators are trying to satisfy an interest in Jewish history and culture, and the recourse they have, first and foremost, is to the Holocaust. But there's a thousand years. It isn't only and just the Holocaust. And so, can difficult pasts and conflicted histories be entrusted to a pedagogy of exploration and discovery? And that's really interesting because uh, a number of the people who evaluated our museum are definitely what I would call hard mastery people. They wanted us to put red dots on certain areas to make sure people wouldn't miss them, for example. And so there's a feeling that somehow hard mastery is what this subject requires and that indeterminacy would not be a pedagogical virtue. And can soft mastery be trusted to deliver hard lessons? And I would argue yes. And what I heard also today is that in many ways, informal education can be more effective than formal education in achieving some of the goals of Holocaust education, although Simone, I think, uh, gave us a very compelling argument for, for the classroom. And so what kind of history is this? What kind of history is this 1,000 year history? First of all, it's not a defensive history. It doesn't start with everything our visitors think that's wrong. Um, it doesn't start with the stereotypes and try to defend this history against them. It's not an apologetic history. It's not a history that is triumphalist about Jewish achievement, for example, Jewish worthiness of how could you kill them? They were so accomplished and so intelligent and they contributed so much. It is not a teleological history, and this is for us probably the single most important point. And that is that we, and I'll say a little more about it, really more by way of conclusion, have a mode of narration that does everything to avoid a kind of teleology, to, to avoid seeing photographs of Jews when they are alive and thinking that in, in, in another minute they're going to be dead, to avoid precisely the experience that was a pedagogical principle that Wieseltier so, um, if you will, valued at the Holocaust Museum that it is not what I call a contextual history. That is to say, we do not first provide something called context and then place Jews within it. In other words, Jews are not a footnote to a larger history. That is, there's a, our approach is rather an integral history where you don't have context as a kind of residual category and then bring your subject into the foreground. And that we reject or refuse or try to refuse what we would call a master narrative which is to say that our goal is to create an open narrative, one that is multi-voiced. And so an integral history, a relational history, meaning not a history of Polish-Jewish relations, but a history of Polish Jews in which they are agents of their own history and not simply objects on which others project their fantasies and fears. And that is huge because historiographically in Poland, the overwhelming historiographic paradigm is a history of Polish-Jewish relations, which means a history of anti-Semitism. 
and obviously including the Holocaust. But a history of Polish Jews, which obviously includes a spectrum of relations, is not the same, is not the same thing. And that is a hugely important message. When I hear, uh, for example, Yolanta mentioned a recent textbook refers to Jews as passive. We also heard a little bit of it uh, from Simone's responses. I can think of no better um, way to try to tackle that than through the approach that we're using. And of course, an open-ended one. So a few of my, our meta-historical meta principles, and then a couple of words on the Holocaust gallery itself. So first of all, I'm often asked, what is the most important period in the history of Polish Jews? And almost invariably, the person asking knows the answer. For some, it's the Holocaust. Probably in this room, people would say the Holocaust. For many, it's in Poland, it's the post-war years. Not outside of Poland, but in Poland, for many, it's the post-war years. It's the period they lived through, it's the period they're living in, and it's the period that is for them the most troubling of all, even more troubling than the Holocaust. And for others, it's the interwar years, the period of their parents, of their grandparents. Nobody says the Middle Ages, which is more than half of our thousand year story. My answer, the most important period of the history of Polish Jews is 1,000 years of continuous Jewish presence in this place. Now the Holocaust might make perfect sense, well, obviously there's no such thing, but let's, for the sake of argument, say it makes perfect sense if you start with hate, because the teleology of hate is genocide. But it doesn't make perfect sense if you start with a thousand year history of Jewish presence and a place that became home to the largest Jewish community in the world and a center of the Jewish world. Now, try and account for the Holocaust in that context. That seems to me to, have to hold enormous pedagogical potential. Jews are an integral part of the history of Poland. They're not only in, they were not only in and not, are not only in Poland, but also of Poland. And this works completely against certain, uh, if you will, uh, expectations or understandings about uh, Jewish insularity and isolation, segregation, and the like. And then, this is a story of coexistence and conflict, co cooperation and competition, separation and integration, and sometimes one of those binaries is higher, one of them is lower, depending on a particular moment or a particular place. But the idea of a spectrum of relations is critically important because this history has been defined in terms of the Holocaust and it has been, if you will, been overdetermined by the teleological narrative of from anti-Semitism to genocide. The, the Jews created um, a civilization that is categorically Jewish and distinctly Polish, and for us, the, or Ukrainian, Lithuanian, Belarus, Belarusian, depending on the region, and that for us, the wooden synagogue, is an absolutely beautiful expression of that kind of symbiosis. Polish Jews became the largest Jewish community in the world and a center of the Jewish world, and finally, the power of telling the story in the place where it happened. And that is, seems obvious, but it's not. Because when I would present the project in the United States or in Canada to Jewish uh, audiences, they would ask me why we were building this museum in Poland. They didn't ask that about the museum in London, the Jewish museum in Berlin, in Vienna, in Paris, but in Poland, they, 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 did, they couldn't understand it. They thought it should be in New York or Tel Aviv. And you can imagine, uh, you know, in terms of its effectiveness, what that would have meant. So we are, um, that, that is the power of telling the story in the place where it happened. And we are a site of conscience for that very reason. And our task is to create a trusted zone, and, uh, or a zone of trust. And this is critically important because in Poland, and we know this uh, really from Magda Gross's work and from Yolanta's and uh, from others, the, this history is so conflicted and the, the public debates are so polarized that uh, our opportunity is to take an approach that would work against that polarization but also offer a complement to the approach uh, uh, that we see in Holocaust museums and exhibitions. In other words, what I would argue is that our approach is an approach I would call constructive engagement and that is that Rather than, uh, than, if you will, starting directly from, uh, from the Holocaust itself and working out from there to tolerance, human rights, other genocides, etc., 
we actually start from the history of Polish Jews and try to understand how in this thousand year history it was possible for the Holocaust to take place and for its epicenter to be in Poland. And in order to be able to do that, we, uh, we have to create this zone of trust. That zone of trust means that we have to trust our visitors, they have to trust us. We have to be authoritative without being authoritarian, and we have to actually, uh, if you will, start from the position that they come to us as people of goodwill, that they come to us open and they come to us curious. And so just a, a, a few concluding words about the, about the exhibition itself. We begin in a space of historical imagination, in a very poetic evocative forest, in a space of time before time, where uh, we are able to stage a story, a legend, that Jews told themselves about why they came to Poland, how they came to Poland, and why they stayed. And we use a very beautiful version of it in Hebrew from Agnon, the Nobel Prize laureate, uh, who is a wonderful author uh, in the Hebrew language. And the story goes something like this. Jews were fleeing persecution in the West. They came East. They found themselves in a forest. Clouds broke. An uh, angel's hand pointed or birds chirped or pages of the Gemara of the Holy Text floated down. And they heard the word Polin, which they heard as if it were Hebrew, Pauline, rest here. And so they said, here we should rest. Now, the idea of starting the thousand year history of Polish Jews with an act of historical imagination in which those telling the story were telling a story about it being divinely ordained that they should come here and stay here until they're taken to the land of Israel. In other words, until the Messiah comes, which is a very long time. And so, to give you a sense of our theater of history, each, um, each period has its own character, but there are certain, if you will, um, very specific, I would say, pedagogical um, devices that we use that, as to whether they work, I invite those who are doing empirical research, come to Warsaw, and you can, you can see whether what we set out to do pedagogically has any kind of learning outcomes that you would value. And I, what I want to do is, that one of the most important is this issue of a teleological history. So when we, basically, um, when we come to the interwar years, well, first of all, it's a, these are principles we use throughout. But where they become most critical, in fact, is in the period of the 1920s and 30s. And we've set the period of the 1920s and 30s on an interwar years street. And this interwar years street is double height. And actually, the surfaces are a white relief surface on which we have projected an interwar year street. And we've organized this very short period around politics, culture, daily life, and growing up. And so politics and, and uh, of course, an historical timeline that chronicles um, events of the period, how Jews responded to them, and particularly the rise of virulent anti-Semitism and the worst of it after the death of Pilsudski in 1935. And, uh, and what's interesting about this period is there are several paradigms for it, but at least two. One, from the title of a book by a sociologist, Celia Stupnitsa Heller, and she, her book is titled On the Edge of Destruction. That's a very Wieseltier way of reading that Tower of Faces, that you, you just, everything is seen through the lens of what happened later, and, as a, and, the, and the narrating of what happened earlier foreshadows what happens later. That for us is an absolute no-no. We said we want our visitors to bracket what they know about what happened later so that the horizon forward to the future is always short, it never gets longer, but the more that they move through the story, the more that they walk, the deeper, deeper, deeper the past gets. So it's a very particular mode of narration. And so the second paradigm is that in many ways, the political energy of this period and the cultural creativity of this period and the investment in youth in this period marks it as a kind of second golden age despite rising anti-Semitism and economic hardship. And so it's very, very important for us to be quite, uh, if you will, explicit about our mode of narration. First of all, we narrate in the historical present without foreshadowing or backshadowing. This is critically important. Otherwise, we've got a teleological narrative for a thousand years, and all our visitors can do is wait for the Holocaust to come. 
Second, that we narrate in the first person. When I say the first person, I mean that, of course, metaphorically. Because what I mean is that we narrate from primary sources and we present primary sources and we work with a whole range of them, particularly in the absence of objects, but not only. And these quotations, if they're important, they're in the original language and they're in a font from the period and they are like a play script and they drive the narrative. So, and we support them with commentary, which is a great Jewish tradition. Then, it's a multi-voiced narrative. Sometimes there are five or six voices, sometimes two voices, but the idea is that it's the voices of the period, and the voices of the period can speak in a way with a style and a tone and with feeling that we, as scholars, could never do, and that's an enormous resource. There is no narrative closure. And this goes to this idea of indeterminacy and operating between the two poles, that space between. And that's, that, that's extremely important. And then there is what I would call image ethics and the intimacy of violence as opposed to spectacular violence. And that is a, a, a principle we also use. And so this idea of the historical present without foreshadowing and without backshadowing. So when you look down the street, and you see to the end of the street, you do not see the Holocaust coming. You see people looking up, and you don't know what they're looking up at until you turn the corner and see bombs falling on Warsaw. And so our Holocaust gallery opens with September 1st, 1939. And the events of the 20s and the 30s are considered part of the interwar year period of the 1920s and 30s. And those events are communicated there largely through news reports and other, and other materials. And we set the, the, the Holocaust gallery within the borders of occupied Poland. And what we do is to see what happened in occupied Poland and look out from occupied Poland to what was happening uh, beyond its borders. And so the, this is a, a Poland that was occupied by two powers, so we don't just simply follow the Germans, occupied by two powers, the Soviets, and the Germans, and here's a good example of how, we, of how we work. So here, in the section on separation and isolation, a series of steps by which Jews were eventually segregated in ghettos, our image ethics is that the original photograph is to scale, it's a snapshot. But in order to communicate strongly what this is about, we've actually created a drawing from the photograph. But the photograph itself is small, and you have to actually come towards it. In other words, you form an intimate relationship with the violence of that photograph. And what's very, very important for us is to understand what these photographs are. These photographs were largely photographs taken as German propaganda photo photographs, and there are kind of three stages of humiliation. There's the act of humiliation, there is the humiliation of it being photographed, and we have that from diaries. And then there's a third aspect of it when it is exhibited, not in this format, but rather when it's spectac spectacularized and exhibited as a big, huge blow up. Quotations. This is a very good example. The section on the Warsaw Ghetto, since we are a site-specific museum, when we do present the ghetto, we focus pars pro toto on the Warsaw Ghetto, is narrated by two narrators, one, Emanuel Ringelblum, who organized the Underground Archive in the Warsaw Ghetto, the Oinik Shabbos Archive, and the other by Adam Chernyakov, head of the Judenrat of the Jewish Council. And you can see here, in the original language, in a specific font, with Polish and English translation, in Yiddish, with Polish and English translation, and all the way through, they are vis-a-vis, point-counterpoint, double-voiced nar double narrative and in the first person, multi-voiced. And of course, we have the extraordinary resource of the Ringelblum archive that was buried and then recovered. And what's critical here is, and this is unusual for a Holocaust uh, presentation, is there's no post-war testimony. There's no survivor testimony. There's no video survivor testimony. All of that material is in our resource center. And then the, the, the issue, and the, probably the most sensitive issue of all, has to do with Polish-Jewish relations during the Holocaust, and that is a topic that we treat on what we call the Aryan Street. And you have to come to the museum to experience the double perspective and a double height gallery of how we deal with it.
but specifically, we are able through specific cases uh, to, uh, and through stories of hiding, to get at a spectrum of relations, which is to say, in this case, individuals who hid Jews, Polish, Polish individuals who hid Jews, and who, were, uh, and who died with them when their hiding place was exposed, those who betrayed Jews, whom they hid, and the whole spectrum of cases. And we do that in an installation that physically, I think, engages visitors in an embodied way in hiding in the dark and in hiding in the light. And here was really um, a huge debate um, about, uh, for example, showing more of the negative cases as opposed to showing more of the positive cases, and we think that we struck the right, the right balance. And so when we come to the end of the gallery, which is not the end of the story, we end with uh, basically the, the, uh, the death camps, and we focus on Treblinka, where Polish Jews were brought, and on Auschwitz, which is largely where European Jews were brought, and we end with a Sonderkommando scroll, and that is where the gallery ends. The gallery does not end with liberation, the gallery does not end with the renewal of Jewish life, it ends with the, it ends actually at a kind of point of no return, I would argue. Now, the, the two scholars that were lead scholars for the gallery, Barbara Engelking and Jacek Leochak, they had always wanted that when visitors exit from that area, that is, the, from the Zunderkommando scroll and the four photographs uh, from Auschwitz, they had wanted to end with a white cube that was absolutely silent. There's a way to actually create a space where you can't even hear yourself. Total silence, bright white light that they called a metaphysical break. And for a variety of reasons, technical, like an evacuation exit, we weren't able to achieve it. But that was what they intended. They wanted to simply break the narrative and create that moment of silence, not a hall of remembrance, but what they called a metaphysical break before moving on to the, to the post-war period. And so I think in the interest of time, um, I won't take you through the post-war period, but simply say that we uh, treat the post-war period, uh, first of all, we organize it around the most pressing question, whether to stay or to leave. And we tell the story of emigration because most Jews who survived and were in Poland left. But we also tell the story of those who stayed and we look at Jewish life uh, under communism and then after communism. And we bring the story all the way to the present because the museum itself is part of the post-war story, which is a story of the renewal of Jewish life on a small scale and enormous interest on the part of the Polish public in all things Jewish, culture, music, film, books, uh, exhibitions, and indeed also this museum. Thank you. So I think we can take, uh, should we take questions? Yeah. So I thought we would take three questions at a time and take it from there. Yeah, thank you very much for this impressive talk about this new museum. I'm just wondering if you have been asked why you didn't do a film, why you decided to do this building and not the film. Because I think this house contradicts the perception of a museum as it's not about objects, as it's about um, dramaturgy, you know, and I think yeah, has there been any debate on this? Absolutely, because particularly, I think, um, in Europe, there's the expectation that if a museum does not exhibit original artifacts, it is not a museum, period. That you could take the whole, I actually, there was, um, in some of the comments, you know, uh, on a newspaper article in the Polish press, one guy said, what kind of museum is this? I could put the whole thing on two DVDs and watch it at home. So uh, clearly, that's really what you're saying. 
Um, what, what, I, what I would argue is, uh, I mean, I don't even know where to start. Okay, let me just compose myself. Um, okay, watching a film and visiting an exhibition are day and night. Watching a film, you sit there in the dark by yourself, surrounded by other people in the dark, and you watch a film, and you watch it from a single point of view that all of the structuring of everything in the film, visually, is already in the film. To organize a story in space is a completely different experience. And what I would say is, first and foremost, the uh, visiting of an exhibition is a social experience. Generally speaking, I mean, I happen to like to go, I like to go with a friend or with my husband or with kids, but I also like to go to certain exhibitions by myself and just be able to focus because I'm very interested in the subject or whatever it might be. But overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, people don't come by themselves. They come with somebody else or several people. It's a social experience and it has a kind of triangular effect, which is to say there is the exhibition and there is the social relationship of those who've come together and they are interacting in relationship to what they see and it has a kind of flexibility that watching a film doesn't have. A film doesn't have, I mean, uh, the, one of the reasons why this is so informal is that you as a mobile visitor are, your, you are structuring your attention. It's a carefully structured environment but it is organized, structured, and offers you experiences. There's nothing tactile about a film. This is, in, even in the absence of original objects, this is one of the most tactile experiences you'll have in a museum. I mean, I haven't shown you all, I mean, you can touch just about everything. So, but that's not really the answer. I think the answer is that this is a story told in three-dimensional space, that um, it involve, you are a much more active player in such an environment because you have to make decisions and choices. You don't have to make any decisions and choices when you sit and watch a movie. It's the most passive experience, and I love films, but it's a completely passive, it's passive physically, maybe not intellectually, but physically passive. And this is a very, these, these, this is a, uh, I would say this is a very stimulating and rich environment in which you make choices and decisions and you engage where you want to go. Basically, that's a, it's a completely different animal. Second question. Uh, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm just curious if you have a sense of the statistics. Uh, how many of the visitors have been foreign versus Polish yeah. citizens, for mm -hmm. example, and also um, whether you're finding that the Polish visitors are responding in ways consistent with uh, your guiding philosophy and expectations. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So uh, basically, in a nutshell, I would say, and, and, but I think that it'll change over time. So I can only really give you the right away, right after the exhibition uh, opened. In the winter, it's generally 70% Polish, 30% international, and half the international are Jewish from Israel, from the diaspora, and half not. And the international are coming from all over the world, from Australia, from other parts of Europe, from North America, from everywhere. In the summer, in the high season, meaning probably from March through October, in that season, it might be 50-50 international, and again, easily half uh, Jewish and half not. So that would be that. Now, Polish visitors. So we have a little sort of an exit situation where there are two cards, and a visitor can pick up either one and respond quickly on the spot immediately after coming out of the exhibition. And one says, I came to the museum because, and the other says, what I most remember is, so, um, one, of the, uh, one of the responses, and it's, not, it's quite common actually from the Polish visitors, which um, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure I ever, uh, I'm not sure that we ever explicitly set it out as a goal, but, the, um, but this, this uh, one of the responses is, you know, this is a museum of Polish history. Now that is amazing because um, I remember when I was, we were, we were like in about maybe 2007 or so, and we had just started to work, to pick up the project and work on the, the exhibition intensively. And I heard a rumor that uh, there is going to be a museum of Polish history. So I thought to myself, that must be because of us. Sure enough, a week later, and people said, 
they were objections. They were Poles who said, you don't need a museum of Polish history. All museums in Poland are museums of Polish history. But then somebody said, and this was in the press, ah, but if we don't have a museum of Polish history, that Jewish museum is going to be the only one. So there was a sense that it is a museum of Polish history, but not a history of the Polish state and the Polish nation. And that's extraordinary. Now, although we focus obviously on the history of Polish Jews, we set it within what was historically a multi-denominational, multi-ethnic, multilingual place, radically so. And the situation now is this utopia of an ethnically pure state. I mean, it's not ethnically pure, but that's the utopia of post-war uh, redrawing of the post-war map uh, for, for these post-communist countries. That's, that's what's happened. So one of the most diverse countries in Europe now has become one of the most homogeneous, and what was home once to the largest Jewish community in Europe is now home to one of the smallest. And for a Polish public to come away and say, this is my history, that's, that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. So there's a whole range of, of responses, but that would be one. Thank you very much. Uh, could you share with us how visitors react to the not closed narrative of the Holocaust part? And uh, if you were forced or your educational department was forced to develop answers within educational concepts because of um, reactions? Especially young, uh, young people's reactions? You know, I haven't, I would say I haven't heard, but let me say first of all this. First of all, we have an education department which is the biggest and the most lively uh, and I think in many ways the most important part of our entire institution. Really incredible uh, education department. And th their educational brief, their program, of course, includes Holocaust and a lot on tolerance, civic education, democratic values, as you would expect. Um, Polish, uh, Polish Israel youth encounters, which we think are among the most powerful ways of moving the conversation forward. And most recently, German Polish Israel youth encounters, uh, also very successful and I think very promising as a way forward. So I'm not aware that people come away from the Holocaust gallery feeling that there's a problem with it not, with it being an open, they don't, they don't think of whether it is or it isn't an open narrative, if you know what I mean. That, that's not a problem. I, I don't, like, what would you think would be a problem? What do you think they would expect that they're not getting? Ah, well, um, okay, so y y I should tell you what happens later. That would help. Basically, we never got to do the white cube, that white space, the metaphysical break. But you do exit, and you do have to turn a corner, and it isn't one you know, continuous romp through history. And when you turn the corner, there are two areas that, in a sense, um, lead into the post-war gallery. The first is what the world knew. So it's Jan Karski and it's Sigelboim. So it's four uh, diff completely different efforts to get word out about the genocide. So that's they, so th so that is that's one. And then the second, of course, is liberation, the end of the war, Yalta Agreement, creating of Poland, and then they come into the post-war period and the the the. Um, if you will, the story of, of those few who survived, who came back to Poland and came back to this devastated landscape, that's where we start that story. But I think the way, because of the way we tell the story, I don't think they come out so emotionally devastated that, they, that, that we needed to, to do something more. I don't get that sense. I don't get that feeling. I mean, what would you expect there to be to cope with that reaction? <coughs> okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.